By, edited by uh, uh, Wrecker and Chamberlain. Now I know that uh, perhaps a few of the attendees at this conference were contributors to, to this volume, so that's why I thought I would mention it. <clears throat> now I was asked by the book review editor of Canadian Psychology about a year ago if I would be interested in writing a review of this volume. And after attending the first personal meaning conference two years ago, I said, yes, of course, I know all about personal meaning. I've been to the conference. Uh, so I happily undertook the task of writing the review, but in the course of doing so, there were a couple of uh, surprises. The first one was to learn just about the sheer volume of recent research in this area. It seems that we know a lot about the sources of personal meaning now, where personal meaning comes from. We know a lot about what the experience of finding or creating personal meaning is like. Uh, we know something about how this meaning making or meaning finding changes in predictable ways across the lifespan. Uh, and I was surprised just to learn how much research there had been on, on that uh, topic. The other surprise, and this came for me as a somewhat more depressing surprise, was to learn how much of this recent work was preoccupied, as much of mainstream psychology is, with issues of measurement. There is now a, uh, what could only be described as a be bewildering array of different measures for different aspects of personal and existential meaning. And I was surprised by that. I was surprised that people with that were interested in these kinds of things would get so preoccupied as most psychologists do with these quantitative issues of measurement. <clears throat> now, I don't want to diminish the importance of this work. As I wrote in my review, it makes a strong case, I think, for taking personal meaning seriously as a research topic, or topic rather than just dismissing it as some kind of naive preoccupation of popular psychology. But it also seemed to me that all of this effort to get the facts straight about personal meaning had to overlook something important. And that was the fact that in our efforts to construct meaning, both collectively and individually, fictions play at least as important a role as facts do. And I thought it was time maybe to, to say something um, about that. Now what I mean by fiction is a little bit different from the ordinary concept of fiction. I want to point that out uh, ahead of time. And it's going to emerge in stages in what I present. I hope it, it'll be uh, clear towards the end of the presentation. But what I'll say about that at the beginning is as follows. What I mean by fiction in this kind of context is a product of um, an imaginative hypothetical mode of thinking that's best described by the phrase, it is as if. And so that's where we're going to start. And I'll begin with a little bit of historical background, although I don't want to get bogged down in this. In fact, there isn't uh, a, a long history of inquiry in, into the uh, concept of fiction or as if, but perhaps the most complete account, it's, it's very old now, is a book written by the German philosopher Hans Wehinger in around eight, uh, 1911, I think that's when the first version of this came out, The Philosophy of As If, that's the English title at any rate, in which he attempts to show that um, what we know, or at least believe to be false, nonetheless plays an important positive role in philosophy, in science, and in life in general. Uh, he writes as follows, he says that principle of fictionalism, this is Vehinger talking now, is as follows. 
An idea whose theoretical truth or incorrectness and therewith its falsity is admitted is not for that reason practically valueless and useless, for such an idea, in spite of its theoretical nullity, may have great practical importance. And an example of this would be a philosopher, or any type of intellectual for that matter, who um, does not believe in a concept like free will, who rejects that philosophically as a concept, but nonetheless, in their practical dealings in the world, acts as if there were such a thing as free will, and uses the concept as an as if in reasoning about moral problems and, and so forth. Now, the main principle that Weyhinger comes up with to explain fictions, and it's a broader principle than just uh, to explain fictions, is the law of the preponderance, what he calls the law of preponderance of the means over the end. There is a tendency, he says, in the evolution of any process for uh, that process to become over time an end in itself. And he says thought works like this. Thought evolves like this. It evolves like this over evolutionary time. Originally, uh, thought, we're going back now to our hunter-gatherer ancestors, thought serves sort of practical purposes in life. And then what happens is that thought becomes an end in itself. And so you get theoretical thinking and philosophical thinking that begins to set problems for itself which it can't solve, but can't help to think about nonetheless. And uh, arguably one of those kind of unsolved problems is the meaning of life and the kinds of things that this may be heretical in the context of a conference like this, but a lot of the things <clears throat> that we talk about in these kinds of conferences uh, fall under the, this kind of heading. They're, in rational terms, they're insoluble problems, but they're things that we can't help but think about just because of the way that our thinking has developed over time. So our hunter-gatherer ancestors are very good at solving practical problems like you know how to get the bananas at the top of the tree or whatever, but the problem of how to find the meaning of life isn't the same kind of problem as how to get the bananas at the top of the the tree, and, and, and so uh, we sort of go around in circles with these kinds of problems. We think about them, but we uh, never finally solve them. Now, how do we get past this basic limitation of rational thought, says Vihinger? Well, v what Vihinger says is we, we uh, get past this limitation by constructing uh, fictions or uh, uh, as if kinds of concepts. And he describes these as the bypaths of which thought makes use when it can no longer advance directly along the main road. And that, I think that's a nice metaphor for this. And then he goes on to say that the, this as-if world that's created by fictions is an extremely important world because it's our human world of values. He has a lot more to say, but that's, uh, that'll do for a summary. And then really the only psychologist that I've found that's taken up the anger at, in a, at all a serious way was uh, Alfred Adler, who a year after the initial publication of the philosophy of as if, came out with the neurotic character. And uh, this work is just replete with references to Vehinger. Obviously, Adler, who had just recently read Vehinger, was very much influenced by him, but he adds something to Vehinger at the same time. To Vehinger's fictionalism, he adds the concept of uh, finalism or a teleological or future directed aspect of human behavior. Adler says we're uh, motivated all the time by generally unachievable uh, goals that we set for some time in the future. <clears throat> and he gives a number of characteristics of, of these fictional goals. I won't go through the whole list here, but uh, the most typical one in typical Adlerian fashion uh, 
He says that uh, fictional goals help us to compensate for felt inferiorities. He writes, everything grows as if it were striving to overcome all imperfections and achieve perfection. And he also says that <clears throat> these guiding fictions are an important aspect of the adaptive behavior of both psychologically healthy and unhealthy individuals. We're all motivated by these guiding fictions, but there's an important difference. The psychologically healthy individual can readily abandon their fiction when it's no longer useful. The neurotic generally can't. The neurotic is too committed to their fiction and believes it too unequivocally to just abandon it. And so they get trapped with their fictions. Uh, it's the neurotic trap, essentially. And I think this is an important point about thinking in terms of fiction. So the, the uh, point is not to mistake fictions for reality. And uh, because that's, that's a kind of a psychological trap. Now I'm going to go on to talk about in the uh, rest of the allotted time some different types of fictions. There's four kinds. If you've read my abstract, you know already that there's four kinds that I think are important. The Hinger had his own rather complex and unwieldy taxonomy of different kinds of fictions. If you read him long enough, you get the sense that according to Behinger, just about everything's a fiction. And I've been trying for a long time to kind of understand what he was getting at in his taxonomy. I can't quite understand it, so I'm, not, I'm going to choose not to talk about it. But there's a more important reason for ignoring it than just the fact that I don't understand it, as if that wasn't you know, important enough. Um, Vehinger's motivation was essentially epistemological, and mine is my interest is more psychological. And so I think in psychological terms, these are the fictions that we live with all the time in both our work and our lives. And uh, so this is what I'll talk about. Explanatory fictions, metaphorical fictions, mythological fictions, and narrative fictions. And uh, I'll explain as we go along just what each of these are. And we'll start with explanatory fictions. And I begin rather deliberately with an example from physics. And this is just to show that the concept of a fiction is not something nebulous and fuzzy and undefined. That in fact, and this is something Vehinger always pointed out, that um, uh, fictions are um, a part of any serious scientific kind of thinking uh, as well. And the example that I'll discuss just very briefly is a kind of a classical example from a branch of physics called kinematics, which has to do with motion. I think that's what it has to do with. It's the idea of the point mass. A recent uh, physics textbook defines a point mass, or what's sometimes called a material particle, in this way, it's any physical body whose shape and size are insignificant in the motion under consideration. So if you've got a rigid object that's under some uniform movement of displacement from one point to another, it doesn't have to be displacement in a straight line necessarily. It can be this kind of displacement. <clears throat> You can treat the object as a single point for the purpose of calculation, right? So it's as if the rigid object is reduced to a single point that has just the single property of mass, or the property of mass and the property of location. <clears throat> And I like this example because it makes very clear the distinction, and again, this comes from Behinger, the distinction between a hypothesis and uh, a fiction. A hypothesis is a conjecture about something that we're proposing might be true. A fiction is something that we know already isn't true, but we use for the purposes of, of uh, understanding or, or the purposes of simplifying an explanation. And so 
it's not a plausible hypothesis, and nobody in physics thinks it is, that all the matter in a macroscopic object that behaves this way is concentrated in a single point. But one treats it as if it were to make the equations come out more simply. And the other thing I like about this example is it makes clear that the function of any explanatory theory, and I think this applies as well to psychology and the social sciences as it does to physics, <clears throat> the point of any explanatory theory is not to map nature veridically and directly in all its detail. It's not to give a picture of nature. It's to make an aspect of nature accessible to our understanding. And fictions are something that is an inherent part of that. In this case, understanding means um, bringing it into the world of, uh, of uh, mathematical reasoning. And to do that, uh, you have to use idealizations. And this is where fictions like the point mass uh, come from. So that's just to show that um, how it's explanatory fictions work and there's nothing really mysterious about them or nothing airy-fairy about the notion of fiction. Um, can anybody think of a psychological example that works something like this explanatory fiction of the point mass? Or, or maybe I should expand it beyond psychology, a social science example of something that works like this. Sorry? Okay, lying. So how is lying um, explanatory fiction? Okay. Mm -hmm. So you might have a theory of lying that says that you know, we lie by refusing to mention what we believe to be true or something like that. Generally, any time that we you know, reduce a complex human being to just one parameter or one uh, thing, uh, we're engaging in this kind of undertaking. Ideal types. ideal types. That's a good one, yeah. Yeah, so personality types. We all fall under one of a small number of types. That would be a good example. Playing on the Val Adler's individual psychology, mm -hmm. in which he's named himself so that people would say, it's not like we have divided selves. We are a whole self. We have a whole style of working. A fiction that's often useful is yeah. to think of the psyche as having several and many parts. Right. While at the same time knowing that the psyche is constantly integrating more or less those parts. Still, it's useful to say the psyche has a lot of different parts. Right? Okay, well, you're anticipating an example I'm going to use later, so, uh, yes. Yeah, the DSM categories are, are fictions. Yeah. 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 Okay, so you see how this could apply potentially to psychology and to the social sciences. Now, one example I'll give, I think this uh, is the closest analog I can find in the social sciences to something like a point mass. I'm sure you've all heard of this. In economics, they talk about uh, economic man. You've all heard of that fiction. The fiction of the human being as an economic decision maker, as a consistently rational agent who maximizes their utilities according to consistently rational means. And of course, we know from psychological studies of reasoning and decision making that people aren't at all consistently rational in that way. I, refer to the work of Tversky and Kahneman and a number of others who've demonstrated this. But still, for economic theory, classical economic theory, it's a useful fiction, or at least it used to be before the current problems with the markets, when I think we're even beginning to wonder whether it works at all. 
Um, and I mention that because it's the point of departure for my first and my main um, psychological example of an explanatory fiction. This is something I think you'll find a lot more interesting than point masses. It's um, a recent attempt to, uh, to explain by an economist by the name of Robert Frank uh, to explain in evolutionary and economic terms the phenomena of romantic love and other so-called irrational human emotions. And I mentioned uh, Steven Pinker here as well because Pinker has uh, added something to uh, Frank's original uh, account. But Frank's motivation was to try to challenge an instrumentalist, uh, materialist conception of human relationships, which is now very common in the social sciences, to try to challenge that kind of conception on, it, on its own terms. Um, to show by economic thinking how this uh, rationalist uh, conception of human relationships fail. And so he d begins by distinguishing two aspects of the phenomena of romantic love. And I have to um, warn you ahead of time that this um, account is an e evolutionary explanation. And like all evolutionary explanations, it's kind of hokey and uh, unbelievable and simplistic. But um, it's not my purpose to defend this, but just to use it as an example. Anyway, what he calls the rational part of love is the part that is most consistent with a kind of an economic and utilitarian kind of analysis. Uh, there's a number of parts of this. He, f he says the rational part of love is the recognition that uh, romantic love or the whole dating scene at least is a kind of a marketplace, which is how it's conceived as veterans of the dating scene and also by some by, I would say, most social scientists these days. There's an element of smart shopping involved. You're trying, you're looking for the best potential mate who will be happy with you. And um, you could be looking for some time, but you don't look forever. <clears throat> and the qualities that you're looking for in a potential mate are not exactly, but they're generally the same as the qualities that everybody else is looking for. Now, the problem with this search from the point of view of rational strategy is that the best possible potential mate who will settle for you is a needle in a haystack, as Steven Pinker points out. In this world of six billion people or whatever it is now, there is one single best person who will, be, who will settle for you. But it's going to take forever to find them. The laws of probability don't lend themselves to a, an easy solution to that. So what do you do? And what does the, more importantly, what does a rational agent do? Well, according to Frank, they make a trade-off between value versus time. They decide after a certain time, there's no point looking any further. I'll settle with the best person I've found so far. And so that's the... Uh, that's the strategy. And he makes an analogy here with the rental housing market. When people look for uh, apartments and when landlords look for best, uh, for, for, uh, for uh, tenants, they don't do an exhaustive search for the best tenant or the best apartment they can find. They, after a certain time, settle for the best apartment or tenant they've found so far. And whatever its limitations in explaining, in explaining uh, human mating behavior, one phenomenon that's consistent with this kind of analysis and that's been well documented in the social science literature is the phenomenon of, of um, assortative mating, that generally speaking, people pair up with uh, others of similar overall attractiveness as rated independently by third parties. And we're not meaning here just physical attractiveness, but, but uh, mate potential. And there are various ways of getting people to, uh, to evaluate that. Now, as I hope most of us agree, this kind of cold-hearted economic analysis of the problem of love overlooks a number of important considerations. 
that are transparent to anyone who's ever been through the experience. It overlooks the experience of romantic love as a deeply felt human um, uh, passionate emotion. It overlooks the personal factor in romantic love, that when you fall in love, it's not with a bundle of qualities, but with a person in all their individuality. It overlooks uh, the uh, capricious nature of love, the involuntary nature of it. You can't choose willingly to fall in love with even a highly desirable potential partner or a highly compatible potential partner. There's an element of unpredictability there. And so this brings in the second aspect that Frank talks about, the irrational part of love. For whatever its, whatever its rational features may be, love is also and fundamentally uh, a capricious, unpredictable, passionate human emotion. And the question he goes on to ask is why? Not a question most of us would ask, but Frank asks this question. Why is it, why is it like this? Why don't we uh, use a more consistently rational strategy in choosing a potential mate? Wouldn't that be better than all of this uh, sort of irrational uh, you know, seizure that we go through um, in the experience? And Frank argues, again, on the basis of economic kinds of reasoning, that... Um, no, in fact, it wouldn't be better if we used a purely rational strategy because that would run afoul of something he calls the commitment problem. And the commitment problem is basically the problem of securing conditions for a lasting relationship. He says the problem with the rational strategy is essentially this. Romance is a promise, okay? You're undertaking a commitment, long-term commitment, potentially is going to have life-altering consequences. You don't enter into these kinds of things lightly. There's something give, that you give up, as well as something that you get from these kinds of, of um, long-term commitments. A rational agent might want to break the promise. A rational agent being somebody that's just trying to maximize their utilities by finding the best possible mate they can find. It's inevitable, given the laws of probability, that no matter who you've settled for, somebody significantly better will eventually come along in the passage of time. And uh, so a purely rational agent who is just looking to maximize their utilities um, has a reason for opting out of the promise. And so uh, the promise is not credible. No rational agent would agree to uh, undertake such a commitment knowing that uh, another rational agent could have such an easy way of, of opting out of it. So what's the solution to the commitment problem? Well, the solution essentially is the irrational uh, part of love because if, as uh, Steven Pinker points out, if you don't decide to fall in love for rational reasons, you can't decide to fall out of love for rational reasons. And so romantic love as this irrational emotion becomes a guarantor of a promise that cannot be justified by rational means alone. And then uh, Frank and Picker both go on to say, uh, and this is where the evolutionary argument comes in, that we're biologically programmed to experience romantic love because this is kind of natural selection's um, solution to the commitment problem. So that's the theory. <laughs> and uh, I don't want to, uh, it's not my purpose to debate on the merits of this theory versus what I think would be more credible theories of romantic love. That's not what I'm after here. I'm more interested in the kind of theory this is and the extent to which fictional elements play a role in it. Consider how a rational agent sort of reasons their way through romantic situations. If I'm courting someone, uh, what the commitment model says is I don't say something like, uh, you know, come with me because you're the best person I've found so far. We know that that, <laughs> that wouldn't work. Rather, you want to make an appeal 
that says something about the involuntary involuntariness of your experience. I can't help but fall, but be in love with you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm seized by this uncontrollable passion. You say something like that. Uh, you emphasize the individual factor. It's you. It's the single, you know, irreplaceable, unique you that I'm in love with, and not somebody like you. Um, you um, emphasize the irrational part of it by saying I'm madly, insanely, wildly in love, not just in love. <clears throat> That's the way that you should reason according to the commitment model. But my point is that the rational agent who engages in that kind of deliberation is a fiction. Because in the course of actual romantic relationships, of course, people do nothing of the kind. In fact, it would defeat the whole purpose of the commitment model if they did, because it would make what should be a spontaneous emotion a matter of rational strategizing. Clearly, this is not what people do. The commitment model is not then a realistic account of what the experience of falling in love is like. What it does is attempt to rationalize a certain evolutionary explanation of behavior. According to the theory, natural selection acts according to you know, presently unknown mechanisms to reinforce a certain pattern of behavior that has a certain adaptive advantage. And the rationality is not in natural selection, as biologists since Darwin have pointed out. There's nothing rational about natural selection itself. It's not in the pattern of behavior that's selected. It's in our understanding of how this constitutes a solution to the commitment problem. That's where the rationality comes in. And this is what explanatory fictions of all kinds generally do. They make rationally coherent um, a process that could easily be explained in other terms, independently of the fiction. So we need rationality to understand the commitment model of romantic love, but it's not required at all for its implementation. In fact, Frank shows how you can formulate this theory mathematically as a special case of uh, statistical decision theory, and that theory could easily be, be implemented in non-rational mechanisms. So, so um, the, the fictions aren't necessary for the theory to work. The fictions are, are just necessary for under understanding of the, uh, of the theory. So that's uh, the rash or, sorry, the um, explanatory fiction. And despite the amount of time that I've spent on that, I don't think explanatory fictions are the most interesting ones psychologically, at least not for the creation of personal meaning. And so we'll talk about we'll talk about some others as well. Now, metaphorical fictions are a little bit different because here the fiction is an inherent or an intrinsic part of an account of something that couldn't be put in other terms, unlike the explanatory fiction. And um, the example is sort of a classic example, which is why I, I use it. It's a, one that would be familiar to most people. Freud's theory of the uh, structure of the psyche, which was a part of a theoretical undertaking, as you know, that Freud called metapsychology. His first uh, stab at it was in 1895 when he wrote a book never intended for publication called The Project for a Scientific Psychology. And in that work, he sort of fleshed out an account of the human psyche in sort of quasi-neurological terms. And very soon he abandoned that whole framework. He found this neurological language of the project much too uh, restrictive for his purposes. So he eventually opts in a later work, The Ego and the Id, uh, for a psychological description, and the psychological description is put in terms of metaphors. And there are two main types of metaphors that, systematic kinds of metaphors that Freud uses that have become the mainstay of psychological theorizing ever since. The first is of the mind as some kind of spatial medium, and Freud instantiates that metaphor with his uh, depth metaphor of consciousness, 
according to which conscious, the continuum from consciousness to unconsciousness can be represented as a continuum of uh, increasing depth. And so here you have the perception, perception consciousness system here at the top, the system that takes in information from the world and supports ordinary waking consciousness, sort of opening up at the top of the diagram like, a, like an eye onto the world. And then there's the pre-consciousness below that and unconsciousness uh, at a deeper layer still. So that's the depth metaphor of consciousness, quite a familiar metaphor. Even cognitive psychologists now are talking about something called the cognitive unconscious. The other one is the metaphor of subpersonal agency, according to which in Freud's account, the impulse systems called the id, ego, and superego are um, represented as subpersonalities within the person that act according to things like motives and intentions and, and uh, feelings and so forth. And Freud does use consistently intentional language in talking about these, um, these impulse systems. He imputes to them capabilities such as, just to mention a few, noticing, venturing, striving, mastering, censoring, struggling. He also describes them sometimes in passive terms as repositories of psychic energy and, and so forth. But he also, the, he also represents them in the, the, this sort of uh, intentional, agentic way as little agents within the person that do things out of motives and so forth. And I'll just give you an example of Freud's writing just to, to show you how vividly he instantiates this particular kind of metaphor. He writes, as a frontier creature, the ego tries to mediate between the world and the id, to make the id pliable to the world, and by means of its mus muscular activity, to make the world fall in line with the wishes of the id. In point of fact, it behaves like the physician during an analytic treatment. It offers itself with the attention it pays to the real world as a libidinal object to the id and aims at attaching the id's libido to itself. It is not only a helper to the id, it is also a submissive slave who courts his master's love. Now, if that isn't agency, I don't know what is. And I think it's clear, although Freud wasn't always explicit about this in his theoretical writing, that he was speaking metaphorically when he wrote things like that. <clears throat> Freud's intention was that sometime in the future, neurological discoveries would bear out his type of account. The future neurological discoveries would show in sort of mechanistic terms where the id and the ego and the superego actually were in the brain and how they worked. Um, it hasn't quite worked out that way, unfortunately, for Freud, but the metaphors nonetheless live on, not only in the pages of psychology textbooks, but in, in common parlance as well. Um, and among those who have used metaphors like this since, the hope has always been that these are kind of placeholders for a more systematic account to be developed at some time in the future. And that was uh, Freud's hope as well. And so often what happens is metaphorical fictions over time become explanatory fictions. But they play a more important role than that as well. The phenomenological function of metaphorical fictions is to give us a way of representing to give us a kind of a handle on what we can't directly experience. And the unconscious is something that by definition lies outside of our direct experience. It wouldn't be unconscious if it didn't. <clears throat> so how do you think about something like the unconscious? How do you bring it into your phenomenology if it's something that by definition you can't experience? Well, you do, you do that by metaphor. And uh, this is something I think that um, Jung understood, in fact, better than Freud. Jung writes, and this is from um, a later work, the Tavistock Lectures. In his first Tavistock lecture, he says, look, uh, 
<laughs> paraphrasing now. <laughs> he says, look, the unconscious just is unconscious, and we can therefore have no relation to it. And then he goes on to say this. Consciousness is like a surface or a skin upon a vast unconscious area of unknown extent. We do not know how far the unconscious rules because we simply know nothing of it. You cannot say anything about a thing of which you know nothing. When we say the unconscious, we often mean to convey something by the term, but as a matter of fact, we simply convey that we do not know what the unconscious is. So any conclusion or any statement I make about the unconscious should be taken with that critique in mind. It is always as if, and you should never forget that restriction. And I think that Jung was very carefully choosing his words here in calling the unconscious an as if. Um, it's a fiction, in other words. Jung wouldn't have been happy with that characterization, but that's essentially what he's saying here. And phenomenologically, what such a fiction does is, is fill gaps that can't be filled by direct experience. This is an inevitable aspect of the mental life of any self-aware being, that there will be certain aspects of our functioning, a large number of them, in fact, that um, we're not aware of. We're not fully transparent to ourselves. And so uh, metaphorical fictions give us a, a way of, um, of representing what we can't directly experience. It captures our phenomenological situation with respect to something like the unconscious. And this is a far more important function, I think, than just being sort of way stations towards explanatory fictions. Now, thirdly, we're, our time is getting kind of short, so we may uh, gloss over our last category entirely, but I do want to say something about mythological fictions. The great mythologist Joseph Campbell has written that the great mythological point of view is it, it, it is as if. And so myths, as well as metaphors, partake in this as if mode of explanation. And the two are very closely uh, related as I think you see if you look at the works of any of the psychologists who have tried to bring myths into, into their writing, that the line between the myth, mythological and the metaphor, metaphorical is very difficult to draw. Um, I draw it in this way, that um, for me, uh, metaphorical uh, fictions are always highly uh, schematic and structural in their composition. And I think the ones that we've just looked at are good examples of that. There's a structural concept, a schematic concept. Myths, on the other hand, are much more fluid and evocative, and they usually take a narrative form, although that's not essential. But their main purpose is to sort of uh, forge a connection um, to archetypal or universal themes in human life. And I'll just give one example of a myth to sort of illustrate what I have in mind. This was deliberately chosen for this conference. This is what I like to think of as the original existentialist myth of Sisyphus. <clears throat> and given the limitations of time, we just have time for a short version of this. And so I'll give you what's I guess could be called the Reader's Digest version of the myth of Sisyphus, although this doesn't come from the Reader's Digest, it comes from the Encyclopedia Mythica, which you'll find on the web. Um, so, he, so here's the, the capsule version of the myth. Sisyphus is the son of Aeolus, the king of Thessaly, and Honoret, the founder of, and founder of Corinth. He instituted, among others, the Ithmian Games, According to, to tradition, he was sly and evil and used to waylay travelers and murder them. He betrayed the secrets of the gods and chained the god of death, Thanatos, so the deceased could not reach the underworld. Hades himself intervened, and Sisyphus was severely punished. In the realm of the dead, he is forced, now this is the crucial part of the myth, 
In the realm of the dead, he is forced to roll a block of stone against a steep hill, which tumbles back down when he reaches the top. Then the whole process starts again, lasting all eternity. His punishment is depicted on many Greek vases. He is represented, as in this particular depiction, as a naked man wearing a fur over his shoulders, pushing a, pushing a boulder. Now, the fictional elements in that particular narrative are perhaps too obvious to mention, but I'll mention them anyway. The characters involved are not historical characters. We know that. I don't think even the early Greeks believed they were historical characters. The events described, namely uh, the key event of pushing the boulder up the hill and then, and then uh, repeating uh, for eternity, is not physically possible. But despite those fictional elements, there's something kind of universally true about myths like this. They represent uh, a universal human sort of situation, something that uh, the author Philip uh, Cousineau has called the creative struggle, the perpetual struggle to create something in the midst of ultimate futility. And I like to think of the creative struggle in the context of the normal academic tasks that we do, writing papers, preparing classes, applying for grants. We do all these things often with a great deal of enthusiasm and a great deal of initiative and, and sometimes with a, a modicum of skill, even realizing that ultimately the papers we write will be forgotten. We're lucky if they're even read by anyone at the time. Uh, most of what we try to teach our students will be forgotten even when the grants uh, are successful, the money will one day be spent. Ultimately, it's kind of futile, but we do it anyway. And the point is the ultimate futility. And um, you could think of life as a whole as being this kind of creative struggle because we're try trying all the time in our personal lives to achieve some sense of meaning. It's not just a struggle for survival, it's a struggle for meaning. But we know, of course, that it ends in death, only to repeat all over again in the next generation. And it's the consciousness of futility that lends a sense of tragedy to this, because there is no uh, tragedy in the futile situation without consciousness. I like the example that Joseph Campbell uses about the uh, grass on a mowed lawn. You know, a fellow comes out with a lawnmower every week and cuts the grass. And the grass doesn't say, well, for Pete's sake, what's the point? Um, but unlike the grass, we're conscious and we get cut down by things that happen in life. We're cut down or cut off completely at the end of life. And um, and so we're aware of the futility, and, 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 and therein lies the tragedy, but also therein lies the possibility of transcendence. Albert Camus has written an interesting essay, a very famous essay, in fact, on the myth of Sisyphus, and this is what he has to say about it. <clears throat> he says that each of those moments when he leaves the heights and gradually sinks toward the lairs of the gods, he is superior to his fate, he is stronger than his rock. He knows the whole extent of his wretched condition. It is what he thinks of during his descent. The lucidity that was to constitute his torture at the same time crowns his victory. And the reason, he said, is because his fate belongs to him. His rock is his thing. The struggle itself toward the heights is enough to fill a man's heart one must imagine Sis Sisyphus happy. My own particular take on this myth is, was perhaps best expressed by Viktor Frankl. And I'm sure that hardly anyone in this room would have any difficulty locating the source of this quotation. This is from Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, a very famous and much quoted passage from that work. Frankel wasn't commenting specifically on the myth of Sisyphus, but he might well have been when he wrote, 
when man finds his, his destiny is to suffer, he will have to accept his suffering as his task, his single and unique task. He will have to acknowledge the fact that even in his suffering, he is unique and alone in the universe. No one can relieve him of his suffering or suffer in his place. His unique opportunity lies in the way he bears his burden, the way in which a man accepts his fate and all the suffering it entails, the way in which he takes up his cross gives him ample opportunity even under the most difficult circumstances to add a deeper meaning to his life. Now, what I find remarkable about this sort of pairing up between the ancient myth of Sisyphus and Frankel's modern um, commentary is that this myth is much older than anything that we have come to call existential philosophy and existential psychology. It uh, was uh, uh, originally developed long before there were, uh, there was a movement in philosophy called existentialism. And I, so, so I use this because I think it shows um, very well the, the, the ability of myths to capture archetypal or universal human themes, even before they become explicitly formulated in philosophy or in culture at large. And I think this is among the best illustrations of that important fact that I can find. <clears throat> now, the last category of narrative fictions, um, I'm going to have to just skip over very briefly, and then we'll get to the conclusion. If we had more time, we would talk about this fourth class of fictions, which I think is important. Narrative fictions, this overlaps obviously with mythological fictions because mythological fictions often take the form of, of archetypal narratives. But the point I wanted to make is that uh, all kinds of narratives, whether they're, they're intended as mythological or fictional or, or um, factual, even autobiographical narratives, have fictional elements necessarily uh, contained in them. And I was going to make that point by citing um, a well-known analysis by the memory theorist Eric Neisser of John Dean's testimony during the Watergate proceedings, which shows that even under conditions where somebody is really trying to get the facts straight and tell the truth, that fictions enter in. And not only that, that these fictions serve an important purpose. They actually assist in getting the story straight or making it intelligible, even when the story doesn't correspond to the facts. And so Nicer compares Dean's testimony statement per statement with the uh, transcripts in the Oval Office of the conversations that they refer to and show that although the two don't match very well, Dean was nonetheless being very truthful in his recollections, and his account was credible, even though it didn't correspond to the facts very well. And so narratives play an important role in... Truthful in the sense that it brings out the meanings of the events he was talking about. The main meaning being did President Nixon know about the Watergate cover-up? And it becomes quite clear in Dean's testimony that he did, even though the factual evidence that sort of supports that is not quite as uh, direct as one might wish. Um, yeah. He didn't get the details right, but he got the meanings right. And I think we do this routinely when we tell stories about some aspect of our lives. What we're trying to do is not be veridical to our experiences, because that would just that wouldn't make for a very interesting narrative, for one thing. Um, what we're trying to do is bring out the meanings, and often we sort of conflate things that occurred at different times and in different contexts. And uh, you know, when stories are are told. Uh, um, uh, when autobiographical stories are, are, are told, such as the story of John Nash in that recent movie, it's, they're, they're told in that kind of way as well. 
Um, okay, so that's the point about narrative fictions. Uh, we don't have time to go through the example in detail. Um, I want to conclude first with a summary and then with um, I want to return to this question of what is uh, a fiction. <clears throat> so by way of summary, we can, we can say this. Psychological fictions are products of an imaginative, hypothetical, as-if way of thinking that uh, performs at least these four functions and possibly some others as well. They help us to make sense of explanatory theories. Um, they help us to um, represent or get a handle metaphorically on aspects, on manifest aspects of our experience. They help to capture and give expression to archetypal themes in human life. Um, they're, they're an intrinsic part of stories we tell about our lives, even when we try to be truthful. Finally, I want to turn to the question of the definition of fiction, because I think this is a matter that's easy to um, misunderstand. And I turn here quite deliberately to literary theory, because I think the term fiction has been used in literary discourse uh, as a theoretical term for much longer than it's been used in the social sciences. And so I think we can learn something from literary theory about how fictions work. Northrop Frye, in Anatomy of Criticism, was published many years ago, made the following observation. He says, the real meaning of fiction, I'm not going to read this whole quotation, but he says, the real meaning of fiction is sort of similar to the meaning of the term poetry. Etymologically, it means something made for its own sake. He rejects the commonsensical definition of fiction just being something that's untrue. He says, if you adopt that definition, then, you know, if a bio autobiography comes into a library, um, it, it'll be filed as fiction if the librarian, you know, doesn't believe it. He says a, a concept like that can be of no value to literary theory, and I don't think it could be of any particular value to psychology either. <clears throat> no, fiction is something made for its own sake, and that calls to mind the Hinger's concept of thought becoming an end in itself, because I think this is the beginning of conscious meaning making, and of personal meaning making in particular. And then uh, Fry goes on to suggest in a, in a later work, he says, he says um, that these fictional constructs that come from literature, like myths and metaphors and narratives, might play a role in the social sciences similar to the role that mathematical concepts play in the physical sciences. Well, what role do mathematical concepts play in the physical sciences? They are a source of useful fictions. And, and so uh, myths and metaphors and narratives might um, play a similar role in, in, uh, in psychology. And I'll end with that suggestion. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but if you have any questions, I'd be quite happy to entertain them. Well, you know, James wasn't the only person to say that. More recently, Lakoff and Johnson have published, Lakoff and Johnson have this book, Philosophy in the Flesh, that, that, that um, well, that was a, the initial version of it, which was, you know, like 20 years old. 1999, they wrote a, a sequel, finally, called Philosophy in the Flesh. Philosophy, Philosophy in the Flesh. 
And they make the, the point that this is how um, language sort of extends its stock of meanings, is through metaphorical you know, um, uh, connections to the meanings that are already there. Um, and so metaphor is all over the place in language. And uh, because of that, fictional elements are pervasive in language. And, uh, you know, philosophers like Wittgenstein make a big point of how philosophers wind up debating over, you know, fictional constructs just because they're, they get, uh, uh, you know, puzzled by the language itself and they forget what the language is talking about. So, yeah, I think that would be quite uh, consistent. That's the problem when you start thinking about things like metaphors and fictions, you start finding them just about everywhere, and you begin to wonder what, what's real after a while. When you, when you describe all of these useful fictions, uh, I, I am drawn to the fact that they are very useful fictions. Yeah. 